Well, greetings, everyone. I'm here with the author Rod Dreher, the New York Times bestselling author, to talk with him a bit about his new book, Live Not By Lies, A Manual for Christian Dissidents, which I highly recommend that everyone get and read, either in hard copy or ebook form. It's available, of course, in both. And we're going to talk a bit today about um, what's going on with issues of persecution of Christians, both culturally and psychologically, as well as, of course, uh, physical persecution of Christians historically and uh, things that are faced uh, around the world by some Christians today, uh, unfortunately. And uh, this conversation is brought to you by the Holy Orthodox Order of St. George. And uh, we're a group that's involved in trying to raise funds for Orthodox Christians in need around the world. But of course, we're also um, concerned about um, Christians generally facing persecution. And um, um, I think that um, uh, our author's book has meaning for all Christians who consider themselves traditional, small O or large O Orthodox, and um, also for uh, people in other traditional religious communities as well who are facing challenges, especially in the West, interestingly. And um, Rod, it's great to be with you here today. It's good to be here too with you, uh, Paul, because we are uh, all, we need to be united now, not only to raise awareness of persecution going on around the world now of our Christian brothers and sisters, but also to raise uh, awareness among ourselves about what I am afraid is going to be coming to us here in the West very soon. Yes, please tell us about uh, the work that you did for your new book and what you have found. I think it has uh, important, somewhat disturbing implications, but uh, insights that uh, people really need to know about, particularly Orthodox Christians, but I, as I said, other traditional faithful as well. Well, the name of my new book is Live Not By Lies. The title comes from the last uh, missive that Alexander Solzhenitsyn sent to his followers in Russia before the Soviets uh, sent him to exile in 1974. And the genesis of the book came about a few years ago when I began to hear from people here in the United States who had emigrated from the communist world and who are now saying that the things they were seeing happen in America today reminded them of what they left behind. I thought that was an alarmist take on things, but the more I talked to them and the more I started listening uh, deeply to them and investigating their claims, the more I began to see that these people, they see what's coming and they're trying to warn us, but nobody will listen to them. If you speak to these people long enough, they'll tell you, how angry they get that Americans just don't take them seriously. Well, Solzhenitsyn himself warned about this in the Gulag Archipelago in the forward to the 1983 edition. He said that uh, people say that what happened in Russia couldn't happen anywhere else. But the truth is, it could happen anywhere on earth, said Solzhenitsyn. So what I've done with this book is, uh, first of all, try to explain what these people were seeing, what, what aspects of contemporary society in the West uh, are parallel to what happened with Bolshevism. And uh, very briefly, the, the main parallels are people are terrified to say what they really think because they'll be persecuted for it. They could lose their jobs. They could ha lose their businesses. They could have a social media mob set up on them. They could lose uh, their, their reputation. This is real. It's not fake. Uh, that is the main thing, but it's also the more long-term uh, implications of all this is we're starting to see books taken out of circulation because they don't fit the politically correct ideological line. We're starting to see uh, religious liberty being taken away, and it's going to accelerate greatly, I believe, in uh, as uh, we see the decline of people going to church, just as you and I are talking just this week. Uh, the Gallup organization found that for the first time in American history, fewer than half of Americans belong to a church or synagogue or mosque or religious institution. We are rapidly secularizing here in the US and that means that people are, simply aren't going to understand what religious liberty is and why it's important. So this is all coming and it's being fueled by uh, secular elites who despise the church and despise what the church stands for. 
and it's being helped by technology, surveillance technology, that uh, is like what they're dealing with in China now with the so-called social credit system. But here in the West, it's not coming from the state, at least not yet, but it's coming through big corporations. So what I try to do in the book is raise people's awareness as to what is coming and what is possible. And in the second half of the book, I went to the former Soviet bloc, to Russia and the other nations of Eastern Europe, to talk to dissidents, to uh, men and women who had fought, all Christians who had fought against the hard totalitarianism that was, that was communism. And I asked them, what is it that we can learn, we in the West can learn about how to resist totalitarianism? That's what's in the book now. Their stories are incredibly important. Th this book has taken on uh, a real life of its own here in the U.S. Uh, I've had almost no major media support or attention to the book, but I've sold over 100,000 copies to Orthodox Christians, to Catholics, and to Protestants, because more and more Christians are waking up to the reality uh, that what happened in Russia in 1917 could happen in some form here, and we have got to get ready for it. I love telling the stories in the book of some of the uh, the, the Russian saints, uh, particularly uh, uh, Alexei Saint Alexei Michov and his son Father Sergei Michov, both priests in Moscow. You can see over my shoulder here. I have their icon. Uh, uh, Father Alexei died in 1923, and Father Sergei died a martyr in the Gulag in 1941. The testimony of, the, of these two men and countless other uh, Russian martyrs and confessors and other martyrs and confessors of the Bolshevik yoke throughout Europe are vitally important for us Americans and others in the West to know, but we just don't know them. Well, you know, that's that's wonderful that your book is, is getting the word out on this. Um, you know, there, there are some people who identify as Christian in countries like the United States, especially, who may think that some of the issues of um, same-sex marriage and transgenderism and so forth are things that are not really that important to Christianity. And I think that your writings, including often your blogging, uh, but I know that a, a talk that you gave at Jordanville a couple of years ago too, uh, among other things, has pointed out, um, uh, has underlined for me how these teachings about family and the anthropology of sex and so forth in Christianity, they're really uh, cosmological. Uh, they're not just moralistic sorts of teachings. And I think that's where um, some people who consider themselves Christian, they don't have a real deep understanding of the centrality of a lot of these teachings so that when um, secular society comes at Christians because of those teachings, it, it's really coming at some things that are very central to the faith and the church. And I wonder, if maybe you could just comment a little bit more on that. Sure. Uh, marriage, as given to us by God through Scripture, is and sexuality, sexual teaching, as proclaimed by our Lord and the church, is central to the nature of reality. It's not just something added on to the outside of reality. It is woven into reality. This is what the church teaches. This is what uh, nearly everybody in the Christian world believed until around the high Middle Ages. And uh, there are complicated reasons why that uh, understanding fell away in the West, but it has been preserved in the East. And uh, we can thank God for that. But uh, when people today, you even see a lot of Orthodox doing that, especially Orthodox academics here in the United States, they try to make the church go with the times. They try to say that the church can change its teachings on marriage, family, and sexuality to be more uh, in, in uh, consonant with the modern world. It's a deception. We can't give this up. We can't give this up, first of all, because it would deny the authority of the Bible. But second of all, we can't give it up because it denies the authority of reality, basic reality. You know, when we think about transgenderism, uh, which is all the rage right now, and this is how, where I think the main persecution of the church, the faithful churches at least, the ones who have not capitulated, 
is where it's going to come from, transgenderism. Uh, that is based on an anthropology that says that it doesn't matter that God created us male and female, that the body doesn't matter. It's a Gnostic anthropology that says we can create reality by exercising our will. This, I believe, in the, in the course of the 21st century, Paul, is going to be one of the biggest battles the church has to fight over what is the meaning of the body. And uh, But we're seeing so few uh, churches, so few Christians aware of the stakes here. They like to think that they can, they can capitulate, that it's not even capitulation. It's just shifting just a little bit to be more compassionate. This is a satanic deception. It's a demonic deception. You know, the... the uh, uh, Rene Girard, he was one of the top uh, intellectuals of the 20th century, a Frenchman, Fra Franco-American. He was a Catholic, uh, and he said in an essay or, or in a book he wrote in the year 2000, he talked about the Antichrist, and he said that he could see coming within the West this cult of the victim, this, this uh, sacralization of the victim and of the weak, which comes out of Christianity. Christianity taught us to to have pity on the weak and the victim. And that's a good thing. But Gerard said a phony cult has emerged out of this that is turning into something totalitarian. He said this himself in the year 2000. And uh, he said that this is a deception of the Antichrist because the Antichrist is going to try to be more Christian than Christ. And so this is why today you hear, even from some in the church, that we must be more compassionate than what the Bible tells us about sexuality. We must embrace and not only embrace, but affirm things that are deeply disordered and in fact sinful. If we can't resist that as Christians, we're done for. And it is coming, it is here. And uh, this is why I try to tell everybody, look to the example of the martyrs of the Bolshevik yoke, what they had to deal with, what they had to surrender, and what they had to endure for the glory of God and to protect the true faith. Yeah, yeah we, we have a Bible study in our little mission, and we were reading the epistles of John, and the apostle there talks about the spirit of Antichrist denying the incarnation. And when you talk about the disembodiedness of a lot of the thought, this neo-Gnostic thought, it, um, it's a little chilling when you read it in that, those terms. I mean, you know, of course he was talking about the spirit of Antichrist, you know, which is a more general kind of thing. But, um, but still, it, 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 could, it does end up denying uh, our, some of our deepest beliefs, you know, relative to not only what the Bible says about male and female, but also God coming incarnate as a man mm -hmm. and everything, you know, associated with aspects of the church and tradition. Related well, you know, one, one of the movies that I've came out in the last two years that I recommend to everybody is called A Hidden Life. Uh, by Terrence Malick, uh, a great American filmmaker. And it's uh, a movie based on the true story of a Catholic martyr uh, named uh, Franz Jägerstädter. He was a simple Austrian farmer who lived in the Alps. Uh, when Nazism came to his village, everybody in, the, in this little Catholic village surrendered to the Nazis, except for Franz and his wife. And eventually the Nazis put him in prison and executed him for refusing to swear allegiance to Hitler. Now, what's so important about Franz is that he was no different from anybody else in that village. It was a farming village. But because of the way he had lived out his faith prior to the coming of the Nazis, he was able to identify Hitler and Hitler's philosophy as of Antichrist. And mm -hmm. he not only was able to see that, but he was able to know what he had to do to resist it. He suffered rejection and persecution from his own neighbors in his village. And ultimately, as I said, he gave his life. Uh, this is, I recommend this movie because it's something all of us, Orthodox and otherwise, need to be aware of. We have to be living our lives on this very day so that when the Antichrist or some forces of Antichrist come toward us, whether or not it's the Antichrist of Scripture, but an anti-Christian force comes to us, we can recognize it for what it is, and we can know what we have to do and what we have to suffer for the sake of being faithful to our Lord and to the truth. Your, your book and your other writings are so helpful because among other things, they indicate that um, the, the project of pluralism in the United States, trying to ensure religious freedom through legislation as secularism has marched on in these areas. And it's really accelerate, accelerated, you know, even since the, um, 
um, finding of uh, same-sex marriage as a constitutional right in 2015 by the Supreme Court, um, the, the trend towards transgenderism and now polyamory and other things mm -hmm. has just accelerated so quickly. And I remember you saying that you were, I, as I recall, in, you know, kind of walking around Congress or talking to some uh, Republican um, staff uh, about uh, what would be done to guarantee religious freedom in the wake of that 2015 decision. And nobody seemed to care or nobody seemed to be doing anything. So we can't really look to that sort of protection anymore as traditional Christians uh, to a large extent anyway. No, we can't. You're right about that. This was 2015 after the Obergefell decision. And uh, I at least thought, naive person that I am, that the Republicans, as a party that likes to talk about being in favor of traditional values and the party that a lot of religious conservatives vote for, would be willing to stand in the breach and, and at least protect religious liberty, even though we had lost uh, the, the fight about gay marriage. But they had nothing to say. That's when I knew, Paul, that, that we were really on our own, we Christians. And sure enough, as the years have gone by, this has been shown to us over and over and over again, because I think in large part, Republicans are afraid to be called bigoted and they're afraid to offend big corporations. This is something that American uh, conservatives really struggle to understand, especially if they're of my generation and yours, raised in the last years of the Cold War, we had this idea that uh, the enemy was the big state. And uh, if big business wasn't our friends, at least we had nothing to worry about from them because we, we thought capitalism was awesome. Well, now we get to a point where in the last decade, at least big business has become very woke, as we say, very progressive, very much uh, pushing at the vanguard of pushing progressive politics especially around LGBT. And uh, I, I think that it is a long past time for conservatives, religious conservatives and others to wake up and realize that big business is a, as much a threat to us as big government is. And we have got to form uh, resilient communities. Uh, with It should happen in the church, but if it doesn't happen in the church, it should happen between churches where we can protect each other and help each other win we are forced to suffer when we are forced to lose our jobs. I'll say one more thing about that. When I was in Poland uh, doing research for Live Not By Lies, I spoke to a couple of Polish business executives who work for the Polish branch of American and Western European multinational corporations. And they said, listen, we're Catholics. We do not believe in gay pride. It, it, it violates our conscience. And we feel that we're being forced as a condition of our employment in these Western companies to participate in gay pride celebrations. To them, this felt like cultural imperialism coming from the West. And, and they didn't know what to do because they said, you know, the best jobs in this country are in Western companies and we have families to support and so on. What should we do? Well, I didn't know what to tell them as uh, an American who just flew in and don't know their families, don't know their situations. But I did tell them, you are right. This is cultural imperialism coming from the West. I hope you will resist it. I hope you, you still have a government in this country that cares about standing up to big business on behalf of traditional morals and protecting religious conscience. I hope you will tell them to do that. But it was so striking to me, Paul, to see how, and grieve, grievous to me as an American, to see how my country is now fighting against traditional Christianity in countries that still want to be Christian. Yeah, yeah, it's... Sad. Um, you, you mentioned in Live Not By Lies um, uh, uh, a sort of three way, um, three ways of thinking about or preparing um, uh, kind of threefold, uh, uh, three keywords for thinking about, you know, in terms of how we can prepare for these things. And I wonder if you could just quickly run through those if sure. I'm that right. Yeah. Well, this comes from a man I had no idea who he was until I went to start researching my book, but uh, he's another one of these incredible figures that need to be better known in the West. His name is Father Tomislav Kolakovic. He was a Catholic priest from Croatia who was doing anti-Nazi work in the underground there in 1943 when he got a tip that the Gestapo was coming for him. So uh, he fled the country overnight, went to Slovakia, his mother's country, began teaching in a Catholic university. 
And he told his students, he said, the good news is the Germans are going to lose this war. The bad news is the Soviets are going to be ruling this country when it's over. And the first thing they're going to do is persecute the church because he had seen what the communists did to the church in Russia. And he knew that when they gained control there, it was going to be the same story. So he began putting together these small groups of believers, uh, usually young people who had come together to pray, but also to analyze what was happening in their society and to talk among themselves about what they could do to get ready for it. Father Kolakovich had a, a three-part strategy. He called it see, judge, act. To see meant uh, for them to get together and to talk about what was actually happening, to open their eyes to the realities in their society around them, and not just to keep their head in the clouds and only talk about airy-fairy spiritual things, but to really open their eyes to the realities that they were facing today and were likely to face tomorrow. The second part, judge, was for uh, to direct them to talk among themselves about what was happening and to apply the truths of scripture and the truths of the teaching of the church to that situation so they could decide among themselves what God was calling them to do. And finally, act is to leave the meeting, leave the room, and go out into the world and do these things. See, Judge Act is very simple, but it was a revolutionary thing for those people because uh, when these little prayer groups of Father Kolakovich is spread all around the country, as they did within two years, they began to prepare the underground church for the, to survive communism. The bishops, the Catholic bishops of Slovakia chastised this priest and said, Father, you're being alarmist. It will never happen here. But Father Kolakovich, thanks be to God, did not listen to them. And sure enough, when the Iron Curtain fell over Czechoslovakia, the first thing the communists did, they came after the priest and they closed the churches. But the laity and the few priests who were willing to follow Father Kolakovich, because they did what they did, there was an underground church resistance that lasted for 40 years. I believe, Paul, that we are in a Kolakovich moment here in the United States today. We have to take advantage of the liberty that we stand as Christians to start forming these groups, talking in a serious way about what is coming and what is likely to come and what we need to do about it. Kolakovich knew when he came there in 1943 that they didn't have all the time in the world. He wasted no time. We can't waste time either. And I, part of that I know from your writings, both the Benedict Option and Live Not By Lies, is thinking more intentionally about um, networks within our parishes, um, how we can maybe live closer to each other uh, as believers and parish members and uh, schools, all these things, you know, thinking, uh, thinking through how do we build, um, uh, not, not to retreat from the world, but at the same time to have a strong basis, a strong network uh, so that we can rely on each other in times of trouble, as you said. Well, yeah, and just it's uh, providential that today, this morning, I was reading about Father Sergei Mechev and his father, Father Alexei, both now saints, as I said. Uh, father Alexei uh, was there in Moscow at the Mar church on the Maraseka Street, and he led his parish. He was well known as an elder, one of the greatest elders of uh, 20th century Russia, and he led his parish to be like a monastery in the world. Uh, he wanted his people in his parish to live more spiritually disciplined lives. They weren't monks and nuns, but he wanted them to be that, so intentional about their Christian lives uh, that it, it was at least ran parallel to monasticism. Uh, when his son, uh, after his death in 1923, his son, Father Sergei, took the parish over, he continued his father's work. He referred to them as a repenting liturgical family. That was how he called his church, a repenting liturgical family, because uh, they knew what was coming. And they knew that in order to survive as faithful Orthodox Christians, they had to have built up their muscles, their ascetic muscles, their prayerful muscles, their spiritual muscles for the persecution. And indeed, in uh, 1927, when the Soviets declared, I think it's the living church, uh, Father Sergei refused to go along with it. They arrested him and sent him into exile. They confiscated the church. But because Father, Father Alexei and then Father Sergei prepared the people, even when they couldn't come to the church, they still knew what they had to do and they knew how to worship God.
Well, thank God. Yeah. Um, well, it's been wonderful talking with you, Rod. And uh, again, I encourage everyone to get your book, Live Not By Lies, a manual for Christian dissidents. Um, we'll try to post a link um, at the end of the video here uh, for people who are interested in getting that. And um, also, I wanted to uh, uh, tell you that the Grand Knight of our order, the Holy Orthodox Order of St. George, uh, Grand Knight Constantine, um, he asked, uh, that I tell you that um, uh, we're uh, making you an, um, a knight's companion in the Order of St. George in recognition of all your work um, on behalf of uh, Christians and Orthodox Christians in your writing and uh, the way that you help to uh, uh, raise the alarm in a wise way about uh, what Christians are facing around the world today and uh, especially in some of the developed countries that where we thought there was not so much of a threat to Christianity historically, uh, but indeed uh, there is, uh, as you know. So uh, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll be getting a copy of the proclamation um, of that too. And I, I understand you're going to be doing some traveling, I think to France and Hungary, is that right? Yeah. Well, France has been canceled because they've just gone back into lockdown, but I will be in Hungary and Budapest for the summer doing some work uh, at the Danube Institute, a think tank there. And I'm hoping to deepen my uh, my studies of communism, the communist experience there and, uh, and the resistance of the church uh, under communism. And uh, it, it's been such a privilege to have met so many of these people uh, in Russia and Eastern Europe uh, because they they have such a gift for us, Paul. You know, it's, it's extraordinary how how they've just been sent down the memory hole here in the West after the fall of communism. It's yeah. as if they never existed. And uh, I, when you talk to young people today who were born after the end of the Cold War here in America, they don't even know what that was. They don't know what the gulag is. They don't know what the church suffered and others had to suffer. We are so privileged to be Orthodox Christians, you and I, uh, because we have access to the testimonies of the martyrs and confessors of the Bolshevik yoke. And I think not only do we have, or are we blessed in that, but we have a responsibility to share that with our fellow Americans, to let them know what their brothers and sisters in Christ in Russia and, and the Soviet bloc suffered by mil, uh, at the hands of militant atheism, because we could, it could happen again. If we forget what happened, it could easily happen again. And it's your responsibility and my responsibility not to let people forget. So thank you and thanks to the Order uh, of St. George for this important work you do. I'm honored and thrilled and uh, blessed to be standing with you. Thank you so much, Rod, and glory to God. And thank you for all your work and uh, really appreciate it so much. And uh, safe travels to you as well. God bless you. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah.